Well done. Thank you so much. Okay, so our next speaker is Peng Liu. Uh, so, uh, so Peng Liu did his uh, did his BS at Peking University, uh, and then um, did, we've got a third Canadian connection. So he did his um, he did his master's first at Guelph, and then he went to do a PhD at UCLA with Ken Hauk, and then. Um, during that time, uh, he was in incredibly uh, collaborative, not just within the center, but actually beyond the center as well, following actually the great example that the, the Professor Haug shows in terms of broad based collaboration. And, and, and that type of activity has continued in his own independent career, where he's made a lot of connections with very, various experimentalists and has been really impactful in his uh, independent research career since uh, uh, 2014. And we're looking forward to hearing various aspects of that work. Uh, the title is Computational Approaches for Mechanistically Guided Catalyst Discovery. Looking forward to your talk, Ben. Yes, thank you, uh, Hugh, for the introduction. And uh, you know, I just want to start by uh, thanking the and uh, uh, thanking the uh, CCHF to really provide this a wonderful opportunity uh, for me to share uh, our research. Uh, not not only that, uh, you know, CCHF has uh, uh, made the uh, you know the uh, wonderful connections to uh, for me when I was a, a PhD student and postdoc in Ken Hawks Group. Uh, to this wonderful uh, group of people. But really, I got a lot of inspiration from those uh, discussions. I still remember this uh, two hour weekly meetings where I learned everything about you know, organic uh, chemistry. And I was uh, uh, fortunate en enough to uh, get the, the chance to collaborate with various research groups uh, back in the center. And of course, you know, I had also fortunate to, uh, to get to know a lot of the talented PhD and postdoc students uh, in the center who now have uh, started their own independent careers. And my interaction with the center didn't stop after I leave uh, uh, UCLA. And uh, in fact, you know, I uh, started my own collaboration with the Risman Chopin's uh, group, you know, who actually I first met at one of those uh, CCSF uh, center meetings, and also John Montgomery's group. And of course, we have this very productive uh, collaboration with uh, Carrie Ingle uh, with 12 uh, collaborative papers uh, so far and the growing. And we also just started another collaboration with the Hill Group uh, on, a, on another uh, collaborative projects. And I think that everyone can probably have a long list of the achievements or impacts. You know, CCF, CCHF have really transformed uh, the whole scientific community. But to me, uh, what's the most inspirational is that CCHF really taught me that you know there is a, a strong desire that you know, uh, organic chemists should change the way that we work, right? So uh, what I learned uh, when I was in the center is, you know, uh, we people really want to collaborate, and we, when there is a possibility that you know we may change the way that you know we work uh, in whatever you develop a chemical reactions. So uh, what we've been thinking is, if you think about the, the, the typical catalyst development approach, and you can probably summarize that into this so-called waterfall model. This is particularly a linear approach, you know, uh, have this very logical uh, steps. Uh, but of course, the shortcoming of this is, you know, the center of this is uh, based on a lot of a trial and error experiment. And, uh, uh, you know, there is very little mechanistic insight, you know, when you actually optimizing your catalyst. And we were wondering, is there a way that, you know, we can work together between computational and experimental chemists and we can transform the way that we develop catalytic uh, reactions. And we thought, you know, if we have this opportunity to have this uh, real-time collaboration, and maybe we can propose this uh, entirely different way that we discover new catalytic transformation. You know, let's say if you already have some preliminary insights about the mechanism of the reaction, you know, then we can calculate uh, whether a catalyst is uh, reactive or not, or selective or not. And we can make this uh, 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 predictions to experimental system uh, in terms of how to improve a existing catalyst system and the experiment can then uh, be used to validate the computational predictions. And then we use uh, this sort of iterative approach that eventually leads to a, a catalyst discovery. So this approach sounds promising, but then we've been thinking, how can we make this work? You know, uh, at least the computationally, 
uh, we need to address two fundamental questions. You know, uh, again, we, we think we have some reasonable ways to get, you know, energies and uh, geometries from our computational data, right? But that doesn't tell you how uh, to basically modify your catalyst system. So we really need to get this uh, so-called on the fly understanding from these uh, uh, close interactions. And you know, in those process, we have to make sure, you know, we uh, want to minimize the, the human bias when we interpret the computational data. And also eventually we want to make our uh, computational mechanistic studies uh, much shorter you know, than the uh, typical time that we will uh, uh, need to investigate those reactions. Hopefully, you know, uh, by shortening the time for a computational mechanistic study from months uh, to days or maybe in the future uh, to hours to get some useful insight that can be used to guide experimental development. So, and of course, if you can achieve that, you can list a number of uh, uh, benefits, right? So the, the key of this is we, we hope, you know, this can accelerate the catalyst discovery by providing the rational insights into catalyst design. And also we think that this approach can also save the resource, both in terms of uh, reducing the number of experimental screening and also reducing the number of uh, catalysts that we have to calculate or screen computationally. So our philosophy in terms of uh, uh, getting to those uh, um, on the fly understanding is, as I mentioned, that we need a robust and unbiased computational uh, approach, uh, but the re end result should be uh, human interpretable because, you know, we still want to get uh, immediate insight that can, can be used for the rational callous prediction. And uh, uh, we think uh, we uh, uh, want to deal with a relatively small number of callous structures computationally, uh, which means that we want to do high level quantum mechanical calculations, but we want to provide a high quality data uh, that uh, uh, will be reliable, uh, even with the, the smaller number of callous that we studied. So uh, with those in, in, uh, 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 in mind, you know, we first explored the use of energy decomposition analysis uh, to study transient metal uh, catalysis. So the idea is you know, we uh, can uh, use a similar approach uh, uh, that's related to the distortion interaction model uh, uh, proposed by my previous uh, advisor, Ken Hope. So we can separate the activation energy into three different uh, uh, in, uh, energy terms. You know, we can first uh, calculate the distortion energy of the callus and the substrate, and then we separated the interaction energy between the callus and the substrate into two different types of interactions. So we can first uh, calculate the so-called through space interactions, which basically is the non-bonding interaction between the ligand and the substrate itself in the absence of the metal center. And then the rest of the interaction is the, the through bond interactions. So the benefit of, benefit of doing this is then, you know, we can have a very careful look at the non-covalent interactions between the ligand and the substrate by using this uh, second generation ALMO EDA approach in QCAM5. So uh, using this uh, EDA approach, uh, we can separate this uh, inter, uh, through space interaction into several energetic uh, terms uh, which are chemically meaningful. So these include the Pauli repulsions or closed out repulsions, you know, electrostatic attraction or repulsions, uh, polarization, charge transfer, and also London dispersion interaction and the salvation energy. So the bottom line is if we uh, are given any two transient state, and if we do this energy decomposition analysis, and we can immediately tell which one of those many components is the dominant factor that affects the relative energy of those two transient states. And immediately we'll know uh, uh, the, uh, some mechanistic insights that you know, uh, will tell us about the different catalyst uh, uh, reactivity or selectivity. So we first apply this approach to a copper hydride catalyst uh, hydroamination reactions in collaboration with Buckwold. So the Buckwold group has established experimentally that the use of this uh, diterbutyl paramethoxy substituted DTBM sacfos ligand leads to much more enhanced reactivity experimentally. And this actually agree with our calculated activation barrier for this hydrocuperation step. Uh, but of course, you know, the calculation, this type of calculation itself does not tell you why this ligand works better. By using our EDA approach, uh, we separated the activation energy into those uh, energetic terms I mentioned earlier. And it was found out that uh, the dominant factor that really distinguishes these two catalysts is the uh, dispersion interaction between the ligand and the substrate in this particular transient state. So this type of insight is useful because we can 
use this to guide us in, into this uh, stepwise uh, ligand uh, optimization approach. So in collaboration with the buckled group, as you can see, you know, we, we, after we get an insight about why DDBM SACFOS works a little bit better uh, than SACFOS, and though we proposed uh, several different iterations, including introducing fluorine uh, substitutes and substitute here, where we found, you know, they can uh, uh, promote the reactivity by uh, more favorable through space electrostatic interactions. And then we can further dis increase the dispersion and also catalyze the st stability in the stepwise approach. And eventually we can uh, get to this uh, uh, experimentally uh, more, much more reactive ligand system for this hydro cooperation reactions. So we were pretty excited about this, and you know, we actually apply this to some other uh, clinical transformations. Uh, uh, using this uh, similar EDA approach, we have uh, studied uh, uh, you know, there's two different types of asymmetric uh, transformations where dispersion interaction promotes reactivity and the initial selectivity. So this is useful because if you think about the typical quadrant uh, diagram type of a process for uh, asymmetric transformations, the typical catalyst usually works by uh, disfavoring the uh, undesired pathway due to steric repul repulsion. Right? But let's say if we have a favorable uh, dispersion interaction in the more favorable uh, pathway. So in this case, you're not only uh, uh, promoting the initial selectivity by uh, increasing the energy difference between the more favorable and the less favorable transition states, but you are promoting the reactivity, right? Because you know the uh, more favorable pathway will be uh, promoted uh, by the attractive uh, stabilizing dispersion interactions. So in fact, in this two different uh, reaction systems in collaboration with Dong and the Harwick, we found that you know, this dispersion not only increased the, the initial selectivity, but also allowed this rhodium catalyst to, to cleave the carbon-carbon bond at room temperature. And with Harwick, we found uh, by uh, using a large main group uh, substitution on this uh, ligand scaffolds, uh, we can increase not only the initial selectivity, but also the reactivity of this uh, copper catalyst in hydroboration reactions. And of course, you know, we can also use the EDA to study other type of uh, systems where the catalyst reactivity is not controlled by dispersion. So in a collaboration with the Yingo group, uh, we demonstrated that uh, the uh, ligand effects for this uh, modified DPPBZ type of a ligand in this uh, copper uh, in this copper catalyzed alkene hydroboration reactions is essentially controlled by the through space electrostatic interactions. If we have a more electron deficient uh, R group here, so that will actually promote the interaction uh, uh, to give you a more uh, reactive catalyst. And uh, we can also use EDA to look at through bond interactions. So in the uh, collaboration with the Hall group. Uh, so we look at the uh, regional diversion alkene nuclear polarizations. You know, this is a sort of a classical question about regional selectivity, about markov nikov versus anti markov nikov reaction pathways. So using the EDA, you know, we were able to demonstrate how, uh, depending on what the palladium catalyst or nucleophile was used, whether the dominant factor leading to a particular regional selectivity is controlled by electrostatic interactions, orbital interactions, or the steric repulsions. So these all sounds pro very promising, right? So it seems like, you know, again, if we're given any two transient states, we would have this robust way to explain what the dominant factor is to give us understanding. But, but while we are very excited to apply this to more systems, we also uh, realize a number of uh, limitations of this mechanistically guided approach. So the, the reality is, you know, especially in the context of a transient metal catalysis, there are a large number of systems that are still very challenging for us to study. So, you know, I have this long list, right? So of things that, you know, we want to sort of avoid as a computational chemist because they're really challenging. And they're especially challenging if you want to make a very uh, quantitative and accurate uh, predictions. And we have been wondering in the past uh, several years, what are the potential solutions uh, to these uh, key problems? You know, we have been making some uh, progress in the area and uh, to, in terms of especially studying the uh, flexible system and uh, complicated reaction pathways involving multi-components. And, uh, uh, but today uh, I will just want to tell you one of the uh, projects where uh, we use uh, metadynamics uh, simulations to study uh, reaction systems where sol explicit solvation effects are uh, important. So we started with a very simple reaction uh, system actually without a transient metal catalyst, but this is a classical problem about the solvent effects on reaction mechanisms. So in this particular uh, uh, glycosylation reaction, 
And of course, depend, uh, this may give you either a steroid retention or steroid inversion product. And the way we teach sophomore organic chemists is that, uh, you know, if you get a complete inversion, so that's suggesting that this is SN2 reaction pathway, but if the reaction occurs through this SN1 mechanism, so you will get a mixture of both stereoisomers, right? But the reality is not that simple, you know, so it's not either SN2 or SN1. The real system is more complex, you know, so in fact, you know, the, you know, most of the reaction probably occurs through a mechanism that's between SN2 and SN1. For example, you know, they might involve a contact air pair where the leaving group is not completely dissociated before this uh, nucleophile attack this oxocarbenium uh, uh, contact air pair. So this uh, phenomenon was described as a con continuum of reaction mechanism, but of course this posed a significant challenge for computational investigations, especially considering solvent would have a significant impact on the reaction mechanisms. So how do we address this? As we saw, we can potentially use this ab initio molecular dynamics simulations in the presence of this explicit solvent molecules. Uh, so you, the benefit of doing those MD simulations is, you know, we can get a lot of data. And from this data, we can get some quantitative metrics or indicators that tells us where exactly is, the, is our reaction mechanism in this SN1, SN2 uh, continuum. So the indicators in the, uh, include, you know, the surface of the energy surface uh, and also the synchronicity of the transient state structures and the timing of a bond cleavage and formation. So the reason we want to get this uh, quantitative in, uh, descriptors is because you know, those uh, quantitative indicators can tell us the mechanistic information uh, in a very robust way, but also human interpretable that really fits well, well into our philosophy in the new approaches of studying reaction mechanisms. So uh, we use this uh, metadynamic simulation to model this particular transformation. As I said, you know, we can get the uh, free energy surface starting from the starting activated starting material uh, through a transient state. And apparently this is a one step a reaction if you follow the minimum energy reaction path. And we can also locate the transient state of this uh, process and we can get the bond distance. Apparently this is very similar to a loose SN2 type of a transformation. And from the uh, uh, MD simulations, we can also get the timing in terms of the time, uh, the average time between the C leaving group cleavage and the C nucleophile uh, bond formation. In this case, we have a very short time gap between these two events. You know, we call this type of uh, uh, mechanistic process dynamically concerted. And uh, of course, you know, we can repeat the same uh, simulations uh, by just by using a different uh, solvent. In this case, we, if we use this uh, uh, MTBE uh, ESER solvent uh, for the same starting materials, we found you know, the energy diff, uh, surface actually become completely different. You know, in, the, in this case, you know, SN1 type of mechanism is favored. We have this uh, stable intermediate uh, in the uh, free energy surface. And if the transient state geometry also becomes more asynchronous, you know, one of the uh, CO bond is very long, the other bond is much shorter. And the uh, timing between the C leaving group cleavage and the C nucleophile formation is much longer. So every indicator suggests you know, this particular mechanism is more SN1-like. So what that means is you know, we do have those uh, uh, quantitative uh, metrics that tells us uh, information about the energy the geometry and the timing of those processes. And we can routinely apply this to different reactions involving different solvent, uh, different acceptor. And by doing so, we can get this uh, quantitative descriptors that tells us uh, what type of reaction, not only what type of mechanism, but where exactly is your mechanism located with this SN1 and SN2 uh, reaction continuum. So uh, uh, with that, you know, I just want to uh, conclude my talk, but I hope, you know, I uh, uh, convinced you that uh, uh, studying mechanism is fun, it's important, it's useful uh, for, uh, potentially can be useful for, for callus the design, but of course there are a lot of uh, uh, practical uh, issues that remain uh, to be addressed. You know, that's basically why, you know, my entire group is uh, uh, fully motivated uh, to study this. So this is a, apparently a picture uh, before uh, COVID, and uh, so now uh, we are uh, still in the remote uh, mode. So this is my uh, current group. I won't really want to uh, thank uh, all of them. And again, so thank uh, uh, and uh, CCHF for this wonderful opportunity to uh, share our uh, scientific findings with you guys.
Are you there, Hugh? Yes, I was saying wonderful things about you, Peng, and that everyone missed. Uh, great talk. It's uh, you're covering a really interesting range of chemistry and uh, having a really big impact. So congratulations. So because of time.